Good evening. You guys hear me okay? Matt Main says yes. He's not my favorite student. Oh, now they all are. Look at him. Yes, can hear you. <laughs> all right, we'll start the video and we'll get going. Oh, all right. Well, happy Thursday to everybody. Oh, Robert can't hear. Just got to plug in the speakers, maybe. Oh, now I got a smiley face. We're good. It's like we're friends now because you guys can joke with me. I feel like we're we've made some kind of bond. It's a two Red Bull night. LinkedIn got hacked. I have not seen that yet. Did you hear about that? Yeah. Really? They, they get. Uh, oh, so they got the password hashes. Yeah. So, they're, so if you have a strong password, you're probably okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, there you go. All right, so class eight, we're going to go get back into technical stuff. And I do have somebody joining me tonight, so that's kind of cool. It means I can interact with you. I can see somebody, which makes me happy. All right, Thursday night, it's beautiful weather outside. we got a bunch of students here. I'll try to get through. I want to know who Maggie is. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, so Tuesday we talked about these things. We talked about network architecture and design. We talked about some fundamentals, uh, just of basic network stuff. Um, like I said, for the exam, you don't we don't need to be. Oh, Maggie made the top ten passwords. Huh. We don't have to be a network uh, expert for uh, the exam, but we do need to know the fundamentals and the basics. Uh, Talked about the OSI model, the seven layer model, uh, application presentation, session transport, uh, network, data link, physical. Uh, TCP IP model, we talked about those four layers and how they map to the OSI model. We talked a little bit about some TCP IP protocols uh, and then encapsulation. And I promised one thing a better kind of depiction of what encapsulation looks like. So you see host A. As data comes down the stack, uh, the transport layer, so we're talking TCP IP, here are the TCP headers added, and then the IP headers added for routing through the network, uh, the network layer, and then the data link. So that's an example of encapsulation. And then when it gets to the, the other host, those things get stripped as it gets fed back up the stack. So that's a pretty good depiction of encapsulation and de-encapsulation. Salespeople. You're salespeople, aren't you? We got salespeople around here. And I'm in the sales office. All right, so quiz. I promised to go over the cryptography quiz. So we'll go through that real quick. I don't know if you guys had a chance to, to monkey with that. Uh, but first question is, if a crypto system is using a key size of eight, what is the key space size? So if, uh, if the key, key size is eight, um, that means eight bits. A bit on or off, so this would be two to the eighth. So two times two times two times two, eight times gives us 256. So the key size is eight, the key space then is 256. Which of the following is a requirement for a secure Vernum cipher? If you remember the Vernum, it was that looking machine, uh, but it used it was the one-time pad machine. So the pad must be used one time. That is true. The private key must only be known by the the uh, must only must be only known to the owner. Uh, a symmetric key must be encrypted with an asymmetric key. It needs to hide the existence of a message. That's steganography. So one time pad would be A. Yeah, yes. Oh, here we're gonna go to the, the truth table. So there there are different binary mathematical functions. Which of the following is a true rule of the exclusive or function? Same value, XOR 
same value equals 1. 1 XOR 1 equals 1. 1 XOR 0 equals 1. one X, 0 XOR 0 equals 1. Well, you can tell that A, B, and C are basically the same answer. So the only one that's really different is, I'm sorry, A, B, and D are, are the same. Uh, but C is true. Sean got it right. Participation. So C. And then there's our truth table. So you'll need to memorize that. If the same value, if the values are the same, it's a zero. If they're different, it's a one. Which of the following is not addressed by the Wassenauer Agreement? Product products exported to terrorist countries, asymmetric algorithms, intangibles that could be downloaded from the internet, and symmetric algorithms. I don't even know if this is in the book, but this is from a lot of the quiz questions I use, I reuse from previous classes. The answer here, uh, it does apply to uh, products exported to terrorist countries. It does apply to both of those algorithms. algorithms. It does not apply to intangibles uh, downloaded from the internet. So the answer is C. And so it's okay if you don't know the answer to that, you will now. All right, so which of the following is a true difference between an asymmetric and a symmetric algorithm? So the true difference. Asymmetric algorithms are best implemented in hardware and asymmetric in software. Asymmetric algorithms are more vulnerable to frequency analysis attacks. They're actually not at all vulnerable to frequency analysis attacks. Uh, some asymmetric algorithms are slower because they use substitution and transposition. Asymmetric is slower, but not they don't use substitution and transposition. If you remember, the asymmetric algorithms use the, the exponent problem and the factoring huge prime numbers. Um, they don't use substitution and transposition. So D, symmetric algorithms are faster because they do use substitution and transposition. That's the right answer. Sean's kicking butt. The rest of you guys are sleeping. How are a one-time pad and a stream cipher similar? Both XOR bits with an encryption process. They are both vulnerable to linear frequency cryptanalysis attacks. That's not true for certainly the, the one-time pad. They are both block ciphers. Well, by definition, the stream cipher is different than the block cipher. One-time pad isn't a block cipher. Um, they are asymmetric algorithms. That's also incorrect. So A. They both XOR bits for their encryption process. It's kind of cooler looking at this screen than it is this screen. I feel like I'm like interacting better. All right, so both, I don't know what it looks like on line, but I'll get the side view. Where do you work? We were talking this. Oh, were you? Are you involved in hiking? Okay. It's Tom Johnson. I talked to him today. We talked like six years ago. Yeah. And so, you know, they're they explaining their needs. And it's funny because, I, well, I joked and everybody laughed, so it must, they must not have taken too much offense to it. But I said, if you would have, maybe I can just take the old proposal from like six years ago, just dust it off, change the price and give it to you. And they all laughed because it needs the same thing that we proposed. Uh, okay, did I already answer this one? No. Okay, both block and stream algorithms use initialization vectors. Which of the following is not a reason that they are used? Uh, they ensure that two identical plain text values result in different ciphertext values when encrypted with the same key. That's a true statement. They're used to add randomness to the encryption process. That's also a true statement. They provide extra protection in case an implementation is using the same set metric key more than one time. Uh, that's not true. They are XOR to the plain text after. Actually, D is not true. C is true. Uh, it's not after the encryption process. It's I'm getting a call from Cambodia. I should totally answer this and play. I'm not gonna though. That'd be sweet. All right. So they are XOR to this uh, after. It's not after. So D is is the wrong one. Um, they do provide extra protection in case implementation is using the same symmetric key more than one time. That's true because 
I can use the same symmetric key more than one time, but if that initialization vector, it would make it a different uh, ciphertext. So Sean, I don't know, you said C. That's all right, still three for four. I think that's passing. Plus this was, we covered this like, I don't know, a week ago, two maybe. How are symmetric and asymmetric keys used together? An asymmetric key encrypts bulk, hopefully not. And the symmetric key encrypts a small amount of data. Uh, an asymmetric key, because an asymmetric key is slower, so I don't really want that encrypting bulk. An asymmetric key is used and then encrypted with a symmetric key, maybe. An asymmetric key encrypts the symmetric key. That's more likely. Uh, symmetric key encrypts data, and then the asymmetric key encrypts both of them. Uh, C is the right answer here. That would be true in the um, divi hellman key exchange protocol. Which of the following security services are provided if a sender encrypts data with her private key? Now this one's kind of funky. Um, confidentiality, authentication, corruption, uh, integrity. Now, integrity wouldn't play here. Corruption, either. It's going to have to be either confidentiality or authentication. Um, and actually, now that I think about it, because I, I wrote this up this morning, I think it's uh, the answer is B. It's authentication. Because at first I was thinking it would be confidentiality, but everybody gets the public key, so that's not true. It's not A. But so my answer here is incorrect. The right answer is B, because as long as that private key is kept private like it's supposed to, then there's only one person who can encrypt something with that key, and that would be, um, so scratch off the A that I have on there, it's actually B. I didn't think this one through initially, because it does certainly encrypt the data, but anybody can decrypt it, because the public key is public, right? So it wouldn't give me the confidentiality. The Vigneri cipher, or Vignier, if you're French, was developed in the 16th century in France. Which of the following is a correct characteristic of this algorithm? It uses one-time pads. It's not true. It was used uh, in World War II. It's not true. It requires a messenger to take the right size rod to the destination. That's the site tail that uses uh, a secret word as the key that's the right answer d bonus what is kirchhoff's principle and why is it relevant the only secret portion of it to a crypto system should be the key so that all algorithms can be stronger excuse me that's actually uh, the right answer that's the whole purpose of Kirchhoff's principle. So that's a, I'm not even gonna read the other ones because that's the right answer. And I don't know if any of you did this. It's kind of, it's kind of dumb, but it's kind of cool too. But you can see by the encryption uh, that this is susceptible to frequency analysis because the Z's and the O's and the E's you know, are all there. So you, you could figure this one out. This is like those ones that they have in the, uh, um, what do they call that? The uh, newspaper, right? They used to have those puzzles in the newspaper. It's kind of like that. Yeah. But just rotating the letters, seven spaces forward. And when I did this, I did this like this morning or last night. So I was counting on my fingers. P, you know, L M N O P Q R S T U V W. Yeah. All right, the next one. This is using the veneer cipher. So if you remember the veneer cipher, that's the alphabets in the table. That's what that one looks like. So you, if you did do this at home, then you can compare. See if you got the right ones. So, all right, so where we left off on Tuesday, hopefully you guys all did well. Looks like Sean did. He was the only one who was typing anything. I don't know why. Would you have typed something if you would have been? Okay, so any questions at all about 
the encryption quiz. If not, we'll move on. So uh, we left off on Tuesday with TCP. So it's cousin, it's uh, at the network layer, or, oops, that's not cool, is uh, UDP. So UDP is, the th so I remember before TCP was the connection oriented, three-way handshake, SIN, SIN, ACK, ACK, back, you know, all that good stuff about TCP, UDP, nothing like that. It's a uh, best effort, no uh, guaranteed delivery, connectionless, uh, fast, simple. I would rely on the upper layer protocols to uh, try to resend data and that kind of stuff. Informally called send and pray, simpler header, eight bytes, whereas our TCP header was 20. Uh, fields include source IP, destination IP, packet length, simple, uh, checksum. So it operates at layer four, uh, used for lossy applications or applications where I don't necessarily care if I lose packets here and there. Streaming audio and video are kind of like that because normally we, I mean, it'll be a little bit choppy, but it still keeps working. Um, DNS queries, DNS port is 53. So DNS actually uses UDP and TCP. It'll use UDP and if it doesn't get a response back, then it'll, it'll attempt using TCP. But anyway, that's UDP. And so we're still in that middle layer of the uh, TCP IP protocol stack. And my left arrow didn't work. ICMP, so remember ICMP is kind of that helper protocol in the, uh, in the network layer. Uh, ICMP stands for Internet Control Message Protocol, used to troubleshoot, report error conditions. Ping is the most common uh, use of ICMP, it sends an echo request and you get an echo reply. Um, Traceroute uses the, t uses the same concept, but it, it sets the TTL at first to one and then it increments to two and then increments to three. The purpose is uh, it'll TTL out and then I'll get a message back from the router saying yeah, TTL exceeded. And then it'll go, you know, and I set the TTL to two. I'll go then to the second hop and then send the message back. And I'll go through that here in a little bit. But ICMP is used for all that uh, on the uh, network layer. Here's an ICMP header, very, very simple. You can see the types on the far left. So the type is what kind of packet this is. Whether it's an echo reply. Um, Net unreachable, host unreachable, source quench, all those things are, are there. Um, TTL exceeded, time exceeded, uh, type codes. I mean, there's you can see all the type codes. There's a bunch of different things that ICMP can be used for. No, general. In general, you will need to know the field names and headers, but um, you don't need to know how, how big the field lengths are in headers. Uh, but I would say in general, if you, you know, kind of looked at this three, four times, that'd probably be enough. I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily memorize it. ICMP ping, uh, named after pinging submarines underwater. ICMP echo request, no listens, sends an ICMP echo reply. Uh, designed to determine, so we use this, you know, if you're a network person, you use this a lot of times to troubleshoot networks. Um, ICMP, one of the reasons why we like, typically, it's a good practice to restrict um, ICMP packets on head-end routers is um, so people can't map my network that I own on the internet because uh, attackers will use ICMP as one method to uh, map out targets. So usually in an attack, there's a good amount of time that's used in reconnaissance, you know, doing the reconnaissance phase. ICMP would be used you know, potentially to do that. It's just simple and easy. Uh, we, you know, in, in our work, uh, it's not in larger networks when we're doing vulnerability scans. You know, let's say it's, uh, you know, maybe a full class B, right? So uh, 16,000 different IP addresses. If we're going to be doing a vulnerability scan of that, sometimes we'll do a, a ping sweep first. Um, because ping is just faster for us. And so then we'll take those ones that responded to our ping packets and load those up into the vulnerability scanner rather than flooding the whole network with vulnerability scanning traffic. Um, it is important to know though that just because I didn't get a ping 
back. I didn't get an echo reply. It doesn't necessarily mean that the host is down. Uh, it, it, ping might be filtered. Uh, a lot of systems uh, may not respond to pings. You can configure some systems to, to do that. Uh, but it's a good first step in, in troubleshooting. Or early step may not necessarily be the first one. So traceroute. Traceroute is also using ICMP, uh, but it's using the time exceeded messages. So essentially, it sends a, a ping request, and it first sends it with a TTL of zero. So the first router that responds is going to see that the TTL. So if you remember what the TTL is, the TTL essentially says how long this packet can live on the network. And every time it goes over or reaches a router, or sometimes you call those a hop. When it reaches a hop, it'll decrement the TTL by one and then forward it on. So in this case, if I set the TTL to zero, the first router that gets it is going to say, well, this is a dead packet. It's going to send back a time exceeded message to the source IP. So that's the first packet. And then when I do the second packet, I'll set the TTL to one. So it'll get through the first router. The second router then will send back the time exceed message. And then I set the TTL to two and so on and so forth until it finally reaches the destination. So if you ever do a trace route and you see it, you know, kind of filling in in your command line, that's, that's what's happening. So uh, a lot of trace route clients, Unix and Cisco do you use UDP packets instead of ICMP. Here's kind of an example. So the source host first sends, actually that first one should set the TTL to zero, uh, but whatever. So the first router decrements it, sends the time exceeded message, and then it, so on and so forth. It's pretty simple. But that's how traceroute works. And the reason why you might use traceroute for people that don't know, uh, I, would, I might use traceroute to just figure out the path through the network to the destination. Um, I might use that to uh, troubleshoot, you know, see if uh, the packets path or the path that I intend them to take, attackers might use it to determine if this is a different network. So if I have an IP address range and I do um, trace routes on those IP addresses and they're taking different paths, you know, especially towards the end because you expect them to take different paths in the middle of the internet, uh, but as it reaches closer to the destination, if it's taking two different paths, then chances are pretty good it's two separate networks. It's not the same network. So you would also potentially use this to map uh, the network, the target network. Not target's network, but a target network. All right, so that's the network layer. We've talked about uh, really, well, we didn't, we didn't really talk about IP. Did we talk about IP before? Was that on Tuesday? We didn't talk about IP? Oh, we talked about IP addressing, right? Yes. Logical addressing we yes. talked about? Okay. Uh, so application layer, I mentioned, I think on Tuesday, that there are literally thousands of application layer uh, protocols. But the application layer for TCP IP combines presentation, session, and, tra and uh, application layers. Those aren't in order, by the way. It would be application, presentation, session. Um, yeah. And so the application layer really does all the, as you go up the protocol stack, things get more uh, complex, things get more functional. So there's a lot more things that happen as you go up the protocol stack. Um, and the application layer um, standardizes the communication. Think of it session control, host to host data transfer, all those things happen here. So we're going to go over, I think, just some basic uh, application layer protocols. Telnet is super popular. Um, we don't necessarily like it uh, because it's unencrypted, uh, including the credentials when you connect to something with Telnet, but it provides terminal, em terminal emulation. So if you've ever Telneted anything uh, and you see uh, something come up on your screen that's all text, that's just a, you're essentially it's emulating what it would be like to be sitting at the console. Um, Text-based VT100 style terminal access listens on TCP port 23. No confidentiality because everything is in clear text. So if you have something sitting on the network that's sniffing the network, and if you remember what sniffing was, it was a system that was sitting, that'd be sitting in promiscuous mode. Uh, it would then be able to see uh, everything that's transferred as well as 
usernames and passwords. Uh, limited integrity because we can take control of Telnet sessions. Uh, SSH is the secure method for getting terminal emul emulation. Uh, SSH works on TCP port 22. Uh, and actually secure shell has a bunch of different things that are kind of built on, on it or around it. So Telnet, TCP port 23, unencrypted, insecure, SSH, TCP port 22, uh, much more secure and, and encrypted. FTP, so FTP is also unencrypted, uh, including the username and password. Uh, it's simple, fairly simple, but it's used to transfer files. Uh, stands for file transfer protocol. No confidentiality or integrity, so don't send sensitive data. When we see FTP servers, we question them a lot. You know, why are, you know, kind of why are you using it? Because you can use secure FTP, which is one of those ones that runs over uh, SSH. Two ports, we have a, and most people just use, because most, uh, most organizations are, or most current implementations of um, FTP are passive FTP. Uh, meaning that they're only using one port, they're only using TCP port 21, but the passive, I'm sorry, active FTP use TCP port 20 and 21, so you'd have to open those ports, both of them, because um, we had the data connection and then we had the command connection. So the command connection was on TCP 21, the data connection on TCP port 20. Uh, you can see the socket pairs. Do you remember what socket was? It was the IP address and the port combined noted with the colon in between. Um, so client source port 1025 to, that's an ephemeral port, if you remember last week or Tuesday, talked about uh, reserved ports and ephemeral ports. Everything over 1024 is ephemeral, meaning anybody can use them. Uh, so client 1025 to server port 21, which is the common FTP uh, control port. And then you can see the responses back and forth. Now with passive FTP, we don't have to open both ports anymore. We can just use uh, TCP port 21. So that's FTP. Do you discourage ports? Yeah, yep. You think of a, I think of a port as, I mean, I like the analogy. I've always used the analogy of like windows. A port is like a window in a house or a building. And so every time I open a port, you know, I'm kind of allowing people to maybe see something that they shouldn't see. So yeah, close all your ports. It's a good best practice to do port scans regularly, do vulnerability scans regularly. Because what you'll, what it's not uncommon is people open a port for one reason, maybe uh, to test something or whatever, and then they forget that they left, you know, they had opened it and it gets left open. So it's good validation that only the ports that you need open are open. Yeah, and that's, and you've got, you know, when we talk about firewalls, you know, there's ingress, and then there's egress. network is ingress. What goes out of my network is egress. Most organizations are very, very focused on the ingress, and they forget about the egress. So, you know, because that's the old school kind of way of thinking, maybe. Because um, I can certainly stop a bunch of data exfiltration attempts through egress filtering. So if I don't want clients on my internal network to FTP anywhere, uh, then I would, you know, would block on the firewall TCP 21 outbound. Um, same with like mail. I mean, none of my systems should be using SMTP, you know, connecting to mail servers unless, you know, there's some business reason for it. TFTP, so Trivial File Transfer Protocol. I don't know, if, you know, it's been quite a while since I've managed uh, routers and switches, but this is always the protocol that we would use to save off configurations. Um, it's lightweight, it's fast, um, but we don't have, you know, being that it's UDP, we don't have kind of the error correction piece to it. Um, but it's FTP is kind of lightweight cousin, I suppose. Uh, UDP port 69, simple way to transfer files, saving router configurations, bootstrapping, diskless workstations. So when we see the boot P process, when you know when a workstation boots up, it'll use typically use TFTP to download its image to continue the boot process. No authentication or directory structure. It's basically just plop it. That's how it works.
no confidentiality, no integrity. TFTP, SSH, secure shell. Uh, for secure replacement for Telnet, FTP, because on secure shell, I can run SSH, FTP, which is secure FTP. I can also do secure copy, which is they're all very, very similar, if not the same. Then um, for secure replacement, replacement for Telnet, FTP, Unix R commands, if you, you're a Unix guy or gal. Uh, confidentiality, integrity, and secure authentication, because everything is encrypted, secure shell. Uh, includes SFTP and SCP for transferring files can also be used to tunnel other protocols so you can tunnel tunneling would be essentially encapsulating uh, HTTP traffic within an SSH session SSH server listens on TCP port 22 current version of SSH is version 2 as there were bugs in version 1 that's secure shell. Good stuff to remember for the test. SMTP pop and IMAP are all uh, related to mail and mail messaging. We don't have to go really deep into, you know, the functionality of SMTP, but SMTP is a store and forward protocol. Uh, transferring email between servers. It's not meant to transfer emails between clients and servers. Uh, servers listen on port, uh, TC port, port 25. Pop three. And IMAP are two other protocols that can be used for sending email using TCP port 110 and 143. Here's a quiz question for you. Who knows what port NNTP uses? Network news transfer protocol. Without looking. No Google. Is it 123? I thought it was 119. Am I wrong? Or are you wrong? I'm sure you might be right. They can look it up now. Oh, yeah, that's right. NNTP, Network News Transfer Protocol. I think it's 119, but anyway. I don't know why I thought of that, but it did. All right, DNS. DNS is used uh, really for name resolution. So humans, we speak English. Uh, that's what we understand. Computers don't speak English, so there needs to be some method to translate. You just uh, there needs to be some method to translate um, names like www.microsoft.com to its IP address, and DNS is used for doing that. At a lower level, once I get the IP address, then we got that MAC address thing, and it, it's kind of cool how it happens. You know. It, it would take a while for me to write it up on the board, but you know, you communicate with the router. There needs to be a map, at, uh, the Google Maps of the internet. There needs to be a uh, that net that network address needs to be transferred or translated to a hardware address at each hop. So there's a bunch of things that happen in order for your traffic really to get to um, Microsoft. But anyway, at the at this level, it's it's just it's taking the name and translating it to an IP address. Distributed global hierarchical database starting with the dot, and then we've got com, edu, org. I don't even know how many there are now. It used to be really simple when we had com, we had four. We had, when it kind of first started, we had com, edu, org, and gov. And now I don't even know how many TLDs there are. TLDs are top level domains, I have no idea. Billions, maybe, no, not that many, but there's a lot. And then below that, you know, so dot com, and then the next hierarchy would be authoritative name servers, maybe for FR Secure. So we have frsecure.com. The dot com would know where the FR Secure authoritative name server is for the FR Secure domain. Uh, and then under the FR Secure domain, that authoritative name server may have subdomains like www, or actually www would be a host record, but maybe um, internal. No, that'd be bad too. Uh, extranet.frsecure.com and maybe in that I've got web.extranet. You know what I mean? So it just continues to kind of go down. That's that's how that's the hierarchical piece of it. Uh, uses both TCP and UDP, both on port 53. UDP port 53 is is the first attempt. Um, so in transfers and things, you use TCP because they need to have that uh, that reliability. A zone transfer is when you have multiple name servers, typically, um, that are both maintaining 
the zone. So the zone is, is essentially all the domain records. Uh, and so if I've got a primary DNS server and a secondary DNS server, they need to have some method to stay synced with each other. And they would typically use zone transfers to do that. Uh, if I don't secure my zone transfers, then I can let an attacker uh, download the entire namespace for my, uh, so that can be bad, but most of them, you know, most of them are like that by default now. Authoritative name servers provide the authoritative resolution for names within a given domain. Recursive name servers or recursion, uh, you can disable recursion in your name lookups if you want, but the recursive name uh, resolution is, I don't know this one, so I'm going to go ask the next one or, um, yeah, it just essentially takes the, like, like if I were using frsecure.com or frsecure's DNS server, my server may not know, you know, what www.google, it's not cached in, in the name server's uh, cache, it would then use a recursive query uh, to go to the next name server. Uh, caching name server is just cache names that have already been resolved. Caching is faster. Here's just an example. Uh, so I, you can, how stuff works. So, but it's pretty cool to follow that if you don't know how DNS works. Those are the, some of the TLDs. So global TLDs, country, country TLDs. TLDs are again our top level domains, but at the very top is the root, root name servers, the dot. Reverse DNS is in at or ARPA typically. Uh, it's when I'm taking an IP address and I want to do a reverse DNS. I, so I know the IP address, but I don't know the name. I'd use a reverse DNS lookup. Uh, and the tool that you typically use for DNS is uh, NS lookup. And I think that's about all you need to know for DNS. But you can play around with NS lookup. Just type NS lookup in your command prompt on, on the right operating system. And then you'll um, it'll automatically use your your default name server to uh, to connect to, and then you can run some queries and do whatever. There's a bunch of queries you can run. So DNS weaknesses. So it's it's pretty important that name resolution be accurate because if I were able to compromise your DNS server um, or somehow trick you or trick your DNS server, I could. You're looking for www.microsoft.com. I give you an IP address that's actually my server and not Microsoft's name server. So I can redirect your traffic to where I want. And that's that's one of the things you can do with some DNS attacks. It's unreliable UDP protocol. So there's a lot of things that you can uh, mess with. You can forge UDP responses. Uh, cache poisoning attack is trying to trick a, uh, a caching DNS server uh, by submitting um, so submitting recursive answers essentially to the the cache the wrong IP address for the host name, and thus and the purpose is to try to redirect your traffic to my site instead of the legit site. DNSSEC has been around for a while now, but very few organizations are using it. Uh, but it, it really introduces encryption uh, into DNS. So encryption for confidentiality and authentication between name servers. Uh, so it's, I think that's, that's all you need to know about DNSSEC right now. It's not deployed widely uh, for whatever reason, but it's uh, it'd be a good idea. Other, so we're still in application layer protocols, by the way. SNMP is, uh, is a protocol that's used, it's a simple network management protocol, UDP port 161. Um, I can use it for any number of things. I can use it to configure devices. I can use it to pull what's called the, the MIB. It's called the management information base, which is essentially a tree of configuration things and items in a device. Uh, I can use SNMP to, it's called walk the tree or walk the MIB. To, in, to find out all kinds of uh, device status stuff, you know. So I don't know if you've ever used MRTG or PRTG. Those have always been popular for 
uh, polling switches or routers um, uh, to maintain bandwidth or see bandwidth utilization or you know any number of things. That's all using SNMP to communicate. Uh, MRTG was is the uh, kind of the open source one. PRTG is the buy one, I think. Uh, so anything that's in that MIB, that in that management inform information base. So when you see um, report interface status up, down, bandwidth utilization, CPU temperature, whatever the metrics are that's dependent upon that MIB. Uh, SNMP agents, UDP 61, I've talked about that. SNMP version 1 and 2C uh, are not considered secure because they operate in clear text. So again, susceptible to network sniffing. SNMP version 3 is uh, better. Most are, are, almost all devices come out of the box with default SNMP strings attached. So one is public and one is private. Uh, private is the default for write access, so that's the one I could use to write configuration things to my devices. Uh, public is read access. Um, change those defaults. If you're not using SNMP, then turn it off. Uh, if you are using SNMP, certainly change those community strings. So that's SNMP, another application layer protocol. HTTP and HTTPS, these are the things that everybody's using in their web browser. Uh, to browse the, uh, the internet web-based data. HTTP is unencrypted. HTTPS is encrypted using SSL or TLS. Uh, the secure method be using TLS. Um, port 80 and port 443. Those are the ports. That's about all you need to know, for, believe it or not, for the test. Boot P and DHCP. Uh, Boot P, bootstrapping protocol. You can think of that as like diskless workstations are using Boot P. Uh, DHCP is typically just used for dynamic IP addressing and other configuration things. Uh, Boot P, network diskless systems, uh, BIOSes. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can you can see it there. The Boot P determines the IP address and the OS image name. TFTP, like we mentioned before, is used to download the operating system and continue the boot process. Uh, DHCP is a replacement for Boot P. Uh, but they kind of have two different purposes nowadays. DHCP, um, yeah, Boot P is more commonly used for diskless workstations. Boot DHCP is more commonly used just for dynamic IP addressing. Um, more configuration op options. I mean, you can configure just about anything in the IP stack with DHCP, depending on you know what the operating systems are. IP address leases. A lease is how long I get to keep this IP address before I have to try to renew my lease for the IP. Uh, but I can assign DNS servers, default gateways, all kinds of things. Uh, both use the same ports, 67 and 68. By default, these would not be forwarded over uh, most routers. So you'd have to enable that or put a DHCP server on each network subnet. All right. Those are the application layer protocols. Any questions? I mean, those are the ones we're going to talk about. Did anybody look up NNTP? Was I even right? You guys are supposed to have internet computers and stuff. So that's going to bug me now. Oh, it is 119. Good. I don't know why that popped in my head. For some reason, I've been thinking a lot about JASC software. That's where I used to work back in that, that late 90s, mid 90s. And we had a huge NNTP presence, encrypted NNTP. Hmm. All right. So simplest part. If you remember layer one, layer one was the physical layer. Simplest part of the OSI model, network cabling. Fundamental network cabling terms to understand EMI, interference caused by the magnetism by electricity, typically on copper. There is no EMI in uh, fiber because it's light pulses. It's not electricity. Uh, any unwanted signal such as EMI on a network cable is called noise. Crosstalk happens when two signals cross one cable to another. And attenuation is the weakening of signal as it in distance, as it goes you know further in distance. So these are certainly terms for network cabling that you'll need to know for the test. Attenuation, 
crosstalk noise and EMI. First type of uh, cabling, unshielded twisted pair. There's a picture of it. The twisting dampens the magnetism and makes it less susceptible to EMI and actually crosstalk as well. Uh, it uses pairs of wires twisted together, four pairs. Cables are classified by category. So unshielded twisted pairs or unshielded twisted pairs is the most common network cabling like this here. That's UTP. But you're, you're a networking guy, aren't you? Yeah, so you knew that. Cat5. Uh, tighter twisting results in more dampening. Uh, classified by categories according to rate and speed. I'm going to show you a table here in just a little bit that you'll it'd be good for you to, to memorize the most common ones. Uh, tighter twisting results in more dampening. Uh, six unshielded twi cat six. So category six is often referred to as cat six. Uh, UTP, gigabit networking, far tighter twisting than a CAT3. I don't even know if you can get CAT3 anymore. CAT3 used to be for like, uh, it's the same cabling used for like phone. Uh, and Cisco Press, so this is a good summary here, just as a resource when, when and if you want to look. So these are the different uh, category uh, of cabling, there's a CAT7, but I don't, I don't even know if CAT7 is going to be on the exam, uh, but it might. So CAT5 is kind of still the most popular, CAT6 maybe. I, uh, yeah, CAT2, that would be uh, in CAT3. CAT3 was also, also used for, uh, actually CAT3 and CAT4 we would use for token ring. Do you remember the old token ring networks? The multi-station multi access unit. Uh, the Mao, Cat2, also the older token ring networks. But everything now nowadays is pretty much Cat5 and above. So good, good to memorize this one a little bit. Uh, yeah, coax. So co coax cabling. Uh, you can see, you know, the makeup of a coax cable. We have the copper wire insulation, the mesh, and the outside insulation. Uh, Satellite TV, so if you have satellite or cable TV, you've seen coax cables. More resistant to EMI because it has the copper mesh, higher bandwidth, longer connections. Um, also used, uh, we can use um, coax cabling for uh, broadband communication, whereas typically uh, the twisted pair is used for baseband communication. Two other types of coax, coax cable, thin net and thick net. Uh, most everything now, I think, is is thin net. Uh, the older networks used much thicker cabling. Fiber optic cabling used light to carry. So the other ones used electrical impulses as signals. Uh, fiber optic uses light. And so when you think about it, like fiber optic, if you use light, you can split uh, light into numerous, uh, you know, you can, it's a, it, there's like, what's what I'm looking for? Unlimited channels. Spectrum. So you can, I mean, theoretically, uh, fiber optic cabling uh, doesn't really have a limitation for bandwidth, theoretically. Wavelengths, there you go. Uh, can be used to transmit very long distances, 50 miles, so they're not as susceptible to attenuation Advantages, speed, distance, immunity to AMI, disadvantages, cost, and complexity. Do you remember the days when uh, they were actually glass? They used to be glass, but now they're all plastic. I'm sure there's still some glass ones out there somewhere. But Oh, yeah. Yeah, they were very fragile. If you bent it past a certain whatever, it, you'd break it. Oh, <laughs> you used to get splinters. Wow. It's cool. Uh, Multi-mode fiber, multiple modes or paths of light resulting in light dispersion used for shorter distances. Single mode fiber, uh, single strand, uh, very long uh, and high speed. So two different kinds of uh, fiber for the most part, uh, multi-mode and single mode. Uh, using wave division multiplexing. So that's where we can have multiple signals because you can take a prism and really divide up the light into any number of different wavelengths. 
uh, multiple light colors, you just transfer different channels using the same fiber. Uh, combined speeds terabit per second can be achieved with WM, WDM. So wave division multiplexing might see might be a term you see on the te on the test, but that's essentially what it is. So anytime you see multiplexing, it's combine it's a combination. It's com combining things. Uh, and this would, in this case would be taking the wavelength and dividing it, and com but combining it on the same cable. So that's fiber optic. Cool. So we really only have three. There are other media. Uh, we'll we'll talk about wireless later. But um, so unshielded twisted pair. We used to have shielded twisted pair too. It probably still out there in some places. Uh, coax and, and fiber. Uh, LAN technologies and protocols. So the first is Ethernet. Uh, very common uh, for local area networking. Remember when we talked about. PANs, LANs, man, PANs, LANs, MANs, GANs, LANs and GANs. This is more for LANs, but you can use this for WAN technology now. I mean, there's Ethernet connecting sites, you know, all over the place. So it's, it's very popular. Transports network data in frames. Original used a bus topology. So in a bus topology, a bus is just basically a straight line and things connect to that straight line, just a big trunk line. Um, yeah, and so not very susceptible, not very resilient, not very redundant. None of those things happened. Uh, later support for the physical stars. We'll talk about logical and physical network topologies. Uh, layer one issues, physical medium, layer two issues, such as frames, I'm sorry, yep, and baseband, one channel. So these are all characteristics of an Ethernet network. This is a little bit uh, better. Actually, I like this, um, I like this diagram a little bit better for this table. Uh, so 10 base five, the 10 means how, you know, typically means the speed for ethernet. The base means it's baseband. And five is typically an indication of how long of the distance. So in this case, it's 500 meters. It, you know, you see the 10 base two is actually 185 meters, but I think so. Yeah, you'd have to write 10 base 1.85 or something. 100 base TX, uh, 100 base TX, 100 base TX. Uh, yeah, what's, what am I looking for on that? Yeah, anyway, you can see the different cabling types, half and full duplex. Full duplex for the higher speeds, uh, basically, because uh, of the technology. Look at the 10 megabits, uh, the Ethernet type 10 megabits, which is a bandwidth of 10 gigabits per second, single mode fiber, 10 kilometers. But this is a good one. Actually, this is probably a better one than the last one to memorize. Eh, maybe both. Most things now are 1,000 base TX, I'd say, Cat5, maybe SX. I'm trying to click. There we go. Uh, carrier sense multiple access. So way back when we talked about on Tuesday, we talked about carrier sense multiple access. That's just essentially how it, it governs how the system is going to transmit data on the physical medium. And there's two ways to do it. There's collision detection and there's collision avoidance. Ethernet uses collision detection. Um, carrier sense multiple access with the collision detection. You can see the steps. There's five steps. Monitor to see if the system is idle. Uh, if the network is not idle, wait a random amount of time. If the network is idle, transmit when, while transmitting, monitor the network. Um, if more current is detected than sent, then it's an indication that there was a collision. So then we wait a random amount of time and retransmit. Uh, collision detection used for systems to send and receive simultaneously, such as wired internet. So collision avoidance was an Apple talk, and it's also in wireless networking. Uh, systems cannot receive, send and receive simultaneously. So if something can't send and receive simultaneously, that's uh, half duplex, right? Uh, carrier, sense, carrier sense multiple access to collision avoidance requires the acknowledgement. If it doesn't get an acknowledgement, then it sends again. So collision avoid, and this is the basics. Collision avoidance has a, is much slower than collision detection. 
ArcNet and Token Ring. So Token Ring, that was brings back memories. So these both operate kind of the same way. So they, it's, a, it's what we call a a logical ring and a physical star is token ring. So things are physically connected to a central location, but the way the packet goes around the network, it goes around the network in a ring. So it's in one port, out the next port, in one port, you know, back in that port, out the next port, back in that port. And that's the token. And so your computer, your system has to possess the token in order to write, in order to send any network traffic. Um, so that's how ArcNet and Token Ring work. They're both token passing networks. Um, yeah, no collisions, predictable network behavior, uh, because we can you can essentially calculate how long it takes the token to get around the network, and then um, so you know how much bandwidth you know essentially you can get on the network. There's not there's not a lot of randomness with Token Ring networks. Uh, ArcNet ran at a whopping 2.5 megabits per second. Um, token Ring ran at 4 and 16 megabits per second. The oldest version was 4. The newest version it was 16. These both these all died. I don't. I haven't, I've never. I haven't seen a Token Ring network in many years. Physical star, logical ring, topology, and we'll get to we'll get to that in a minute. Just kind of what the topologies look like. So. Another protocol is FIDI, so that's how you that's that's how we would say FDDI. We, we don't say FDDI for the new people. Um, it's we we call it FIDI. Sounds like sounds pretty. Be, you know, well back when we were actually using FIDI, we never even there was no FIDI. There was no FIDI scent. You know, whoever that guy is, that rapper dude. He wasn't. He might not even been born then. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, fiber, so fiber distributed data interface. Uh, this is also a ring. Um, it's not a uh, sort of like token ring, but uh, using a t what's called a token passing mechanism. Um, or sorry, a token bus, which is a different token. Um, i trying to think how it. FIDI typically used two counter rotating rings, so you had one going one way and one going the other way. So and, and a, a system was connected to both of those rings. So that gave it resiliency. Uh, but what most people did was they realized, well, if I run both rings simultaneously, I can get 200 megabits per second on my network instead of, uh, so most people started setting up that second ring as um, production two. Uh, so logical network ring, primary and secondary counter rotating fiber optic ring. Secondary ring was typically used for fault tolerance. That's what it was designed for, but most people were using the second ring for transmitting network traffic also. All right, so more physical tip topologies. So what we talked about before, those were logical topologies. So we had Ethernet, token ring, uh, FIDI. Did I miss one? No. I don't think so. Uh, but a bus network, so you can do what a bus network is in national, it doesn't, the cable doesn't run like that. It was, we'd use what was called vi vampire taps. Do you remember vampire taps? Vampire taps would essentially pierce the outer cover of the uh, thick net and into the actual uh, copper uh, to make contact with a copper. So that's how you would tap into a bus network was typically vampire taps. Uh, very unstable. Any break in the bus took the, took the whole network down usually. Uh, so very archaic. Nobody, nobody's really using bus networks anymore. I mean, you could, but each node inspects the data as it passes along the bus. And essentially it's just, hey, is this for me? No, okay. Is this for me? No, okay. I mean, it was, it was not efficient. Uh, but that was the bus topology, physical topology. Another physical topology is the tree called the hierarchical network, just like we were talking about DNS. Works kind of the same way. This is also fairly old. Uh, we'd use this as in, in an older uh, mainframe uh, kind of environment where we'd have a polling that would take place, but you usually have one system that's kind of in charge of the network. 
uh, a network with a root node and branch nodes at least three levels deep, making it a star. Root node controls all tree traffic. Uh, root node was off, also often a mainframe. This is not the most popular, but they are still out there. Uh, and then the ring network. So this is a logical ring and a physical star. So when I mean, a again, a physical star is there's a central system or central, uh, in this case, it was a multi-station access unit was what they were called. Uh, and everything would, uh, it was kind of like a, a router or a switch for the token ring network. Uh, and all the systems would connect to that. So physically, it was a star, but logically, it was uh, a ring. And then the star topology. This is kind of the, the way most of us are connected today. Uh, actually, it's more of a combination maybe of star and tree. Uh, we have a core network, and then you've got distribution layer, and then maybe maybe you've got uh, an access layer, you know, the traditional Cisco kind of uh, network design architecture. Uh, the dominant physical topology for LANs today, first popularized by, popularized by ARCnet, uh, but Ethernet networks. Everything's kind of connected to a hub or a switch. That's just an exam warning. You can read that later. Uh, a mesh network, so a full mesh network is very expensive, but also very, very resilient. So that's where every node connects to every other node. Uh, so if one connection goes down, I've got multiple paths to still get there. Um, partial mesh, mesh is not quite full mesh, but some nodes are connected to multiple other nodes, but maybe not all nodes are connected to all nodes kind of thing. Superior availability. Your world. I should have you teach this part. I was more of a land guy than I was a land guy, so. Man, I'm not drinking my Red Bull fast enough. We're already 65 minutes into this thing. I haven't even finished my Red Bull yet. All right, so uh, T1s and E1s are T carriers and E carriers. T's are U.S. and E's are Europe. Memorize the basics about, you know, T1s and T3s. So these are both US. T1, 1.544 megabits per second. This was 24 channels, uh, each being 64 bits. So if you do the math, yeah, 1.44, 544 megabits per second. Uh, DS1 and T1 are diff slightly different technologies, but they were often used uh, interchangeably. DS1 describes the flow of bits. T1 is a copper or telephone circuit that carries a DS1. So a little bit different, but similar. T3 is 28 bundled T1s. So take 28, multiply it by 1.44, 44.736. Most of the time we would just run you know, round that up to 45 megabits per second. Um, my first DS, my first T3 was, I think, $17,000 a month. Yeah. It was expensive. And it was a fractional T3. I mean, it was uh, burstable. I mean, it wasn't a full T3 then. Uh, T3 and DS3 also used interchangeably, but the same principles uh, apply. And that's basically all you need to know for T1s and T3s. E1s and E3s, uh, very similar to uh, the U.S., just slightly different. E1 is 2.048 megabit circuit, 30 channels. E3, 24 E1s, gives you 34.368 megabits. It's good to know what they are. I don't think you'll be tested on how fast an E3 is, but maybe. Uh, T1s and T3s are much more popular for us and much more testable. So knowing that it's 1.544 or 1 1.5 and the other one's 44.36, whatever, uh, or 45 megabits per second, those are good things to know. Sonnet, synchronous optical, optical networking, uh, carries multiple T1s over fiber optic. Use a fiber optic ring for redundancy. So using, yeah, same technology. Frame relay. Don't need to know a ton about frame relay. I don't know how, do you guys, you guys running in a frame relay anymore? Yeah, it used to be very, very popular, but because it was inexpensive for carriers to provide because it ran over to the same basic 
copper infrastructure, but um, there's just better technologies out there today. So it's not very common anymore. Uh, frame relay, but packet switched. So remember when we had packet switched and circuit switched, this is packet switched. So pretty efficient, uh, no error recovery, focuses on speed, higher layer protocols such as TCP give, the, give you the reliability, uh, multiplexes. So that means again, combining multiple leg logical connections in a single physical connection to create virtual circuits. Two types of virtual circuits are PVCs and SVCs. Um, PVCs are always connected just like a dedicated T1, SVCs are set up every time I wanted to communicate or send something on the frame relay network. Um, yeah, and it, the frame relay within the frame relay network and certainly uh, within the carrier uh, or DELCs used to kind of address where this traffic is supposed to go. So frame relay, if you've never run into frame relay, say to yourself, not as old as, as the rest of us. Uh, X.25, X.25, even older. Uh, again, a packet switch protocol, very um, uh, inefficient, heavy uh, protocol. Uh, it was um, because it had so much error detection and correction built into it because the network itself was so unreliable then. So it has a, just a lot of, you know, did the packet get there? Did the packet really get there? Are you sure it got there? That kind of stuff built into it. So cost-effective way to transfer it and data over long distances in the 70s through the 90s. Uh, global switch X.25. It is different than the I, than the internet or the IP internet. It, a lot of that stuff ran over the same media, sort of. Uh, just completely different protocols. A lot of error correction. A lot of latency and long links. Uh, can carry uh, TCP IP. So X.25, another WAN protocol for all intents and purposes, uh, pretty much dead. Yeah, ancient technologies, that's true. And then they'll, they, they might, um, you know, they, get, they have a little, a few more currenter ones in the book. But yeah, it's still the basic old stuff that, and that's, that's my beef with um, the CISS beef, you know, kind of from the beginning. That one night when I was talking about uh, the security uh, models, uh, Bella Padula, Biba, Clark Wilson. That was very, really difficult for me to teach because I, I never ever used any of those things. And even if I did, it would have been so long ago. At least with some of these, I've used these before, so I can relate to them, so I can still teach about them. But yeah, they're they're ancient. ATM, uh, ATM was nice because ATM was very predictable because everything was 53 byte uh, cells. So I knew exactly how much, you know, how long it was gonna take for my traffic to get. And it was, so when a device on a ATM network was going to forward a cell, it didn't have to do this full store and forward either. It could start sending the cell as soon as it received it because it knew it was gonna be 53 bytes. Whereas on some networks today, we don't know how long the packet's gonna be, so sometimes the router has to take the whole packet for it. Uh, ATM was much faster, not just, uh, well, primarily for that reason. The fixed length cell piece was made it fast. Uh, switched multi-megabit data service, older, but similar to ATM, also using the 53 byte cells. So at least with these older technologies, you don't have to memorize you know, or look at the actual packet headers and get deep into it. It's pretty easy to memorize the higher level stuff. So MPLS, MPLS is current. Uh, uh, really, it works on you know, primarily layer two, uh, which is where most of the WAN protocols work anyway, is layer two. Forwards WAN data via labels, labels that are applied at, at layer two. Um, there's all kinds of different implementations of MPLS. This is this is not Minneapolis. It's multi-protocol label switching. I remember when MPLS first came out, I was like, "Wow, somebody, somebody in Minneapolis must have created something really cool." And then, you know, whatever. It took a little while to. Yeah, I was I was young. Uh, forwards WAN via data labels. I mentioned that can carry many types of. It can carry just about any kind of uh, network traffic, uh, and it you can also 
privatize your network uh, traffic on the same central infrastructure based on the labeling that gets applied uh, to the data, essentially creating your own private network, virtual private network within the MPLS um, infrastructure. Decisions are based on labels, uh, not, a, not encapsulated header data such as the IP header because this is being encapsulated at a much lower level. So I can encapsulate all the IP things in the layer two labeling that gets applied for an MPLS network. That's what allows me to carry all these other different protocols that happen higher up. Uh, can carry voice and data. Uh, yeah, anyway, MPLS. That's a big, you don't need to be an MPLS net expert, but knowing what it is. Uh, SDLC and HDLC, these are both kind of eh, somewhere around a little bit. Uh, synchronous layer two WAN protocol uses polling to transmit data, same similar to token uh, passing. Think of polling as, hey, do you have data to, to send? No, okay. Do you have data to send? No, okay. Do you have data? That's how it's similar to uh, token passing because the polling is, is uh, it's like, do you want to send something? Okay, you can send something. You know, it's kind of that same concept. Um, combines nodes, connect as primary and secondary. SDLC supports NRM transmission only. What's NRM? It's normal response mode. HDLC added uh, ARM and ABM. Um, successor, newer, faster, uh, more resilient. Uh, high level data link control as opposed to SDLC. Now there's a tip, you know, there's a, a hint because in the, the name is data link control. This works at the data link layer. So that's layer two of the OSI model. Secondary nodes can transmit when given per permission uh, by the primary, that's NRM. That was the only mode that was available in SDLC. Uh, asynchronous response mode allows initiate communications with the primary. So. I don't have to wait for the primary to ask me to send data. I can say, hey, I want to send data. Asynchronous balance mode allows, uh, there's really no permission. It's almost like full duplex in a way. All right, cool. Admit that you're still awake. You want this one? All right, finish this one. All right, repeaters and hubs, layer one devices, dumb devices, really. A hub is just a multi-port multi repeater. So uh, what a repeater does is it receives a signal, uh, regenerates it, basically rebuilds the signal and then sends it out the other port. That's what a repeater does. A hub just does that over all ports. Um, could be, I don't know, 12, 24, however many ports are in the hub. So repeater receives bits on one port and repeats them out the other, basically regenerating them and, and sending it out again. No understanding of protocols that only repeats bits. It doesn't make any routing decisions, doesn't make any network traffic type decisions, nothing like that. Repeaters are often used to extend the length of a network where we see repeaters most often used today are in wireless networks to get, and they call them range extenders now. It's the same, same basic concept. Uh, hub is a repeater with more than two ports, receive bits on one port and repeat them across all ports. That's why we don't necessarily like those is from a security perspective. No traffic isolation, no security, all nodes see the traffic in the hub. Half duplex devices, so you can't send and receive simultaneously. One collision domain means that a layer two uh, broadcast will, you know, essentially halt the network. There, uh, there's nothing to stop things from bouncing around over and over and over again. Uh, in the network it should be a broadcast storm, a little bit different than a collision domain, uh, but a collision domain just means that there's nothing to restrict traffic from hitting each other. I don't know if you've ever used a hub before, but you see the little, one light was usually used for activity and then there was another light that was usually used to indicate collisions. Uh, unsuitable for most modern purposes. So get rid of them. We still see them. Do you see them? Do you guys run into hubs? Yeah, and, the, and I know that people like to use them for, you know, their IDS and IPS devices, but um, what we see is sometimes people using them not for that. 
So this is just an example. Um, so that's a digital signal. Remember the discrete on and off. So the weekend signal, uh, maybe it's from attenuation. So the, the network cable got too long. Uh, the repeater then can be inserted to, uh, to regenerate and extend the length of the network. Layer two devices, bridges. So a bridge essentially uh, makes decisions on where to forward. Uh, so a bridge has two ports. And the bridge will break up a layer two collision domain um, and make two of them. So for instance, if the network bridge would create what's called an ARP table or an address resolution protocol table or a forwarding table, sometimes they call it, um, it would see that traffic from computer three and computer four came in on this port. So it has a MAC address you know, table is saying, okay, but this port has these two and this port has these two. So if, layer, if computer one wanted to communicate with computer two, the bridge would not forward that on to the other port. It would just keep it in that collision domain. That's how the bridge works. Uh, so two ports connects two network segments together, provides traffic isolation, forwarded decisions, decisions based on learning, MAC addresses. You could also uh, hard code MAC addresses uh, in the in the table if you wanted to. A switch is essentially a multi-port bridge. So we had hubs for multi-port repeaters, switches are multi-port bridges. A uh, bridge with more than two ports, best practice is only to connect one device per switch port. That is a good practice. Um, it's fairly, I mean, I think that's usually followed. Uh, provides traffic isolation by, so just like a bridge would make a forwarding decision based on what it saw in this port and what it saw in that port, the switches work the same way, except for I've got so many ports. So if server one wanted to communicate with computer one, it would receive it in that, uh, in that port and just send it out that port. It wouldn't send it to computer two, three, you know, wouldn't send it to those other ones because it had maintained a MAC address table or a forwarding table that said, Computer one, this MAC address is on this port. So, you know, anyway, hopefully that makes sense. Shrinks the collision domain to a single port. Trunks are used to connect multiple switches. So those are trunk ports. Uh, not gonna get too much into trunking. So VLANs, uh, VLANs are, you know, thought of, a, thought of as a virtual switch, but they break up layer three uh, domains. So if I want to communicate uh, in a pure sense, if I want to communicate across a switch from one VLAN to another, I have to go through some layer three uh, device. Um, so VLAN essentially takes the network and breaks it up on layer three. Whereas before, it, you know, just a switch without VLANs, it's making all its forwarding decisions based on layer two. So based on the MAC address, oops, went back too far. Uh, in VLANs, it's making forwarding decisions based on layer three. The problem with a switch uh, in, a pure, in the purest form is it may know that, you know, the server VLAN is on these ports and that the computer VLAN is configured on these ports. It's, it's, it, it can't take that layer three address. So, you know, for instance, an IP address and route it from computer one to computer three. That's where I need to, to have a router make those forwarding decisions. So that's eight VLANs, but it can't be used to forward traffic from one VLAN to another. That's where a router has to come in. But then we talk about multi-layer switches, right? There are switches where we combine functionality and have layer three functionality in a switch, but it wasn't always that way. All right, so mirror, mirror ports, I think there was a discussion, somebody had asked last week or Tuesday about, you know, mirror ports versus span ports. This might shed a little more light on that. Uh, mirroring traffic from multiple switch ports to one span port. Span is, um, span is what Cisco uses, HP uses mirror port. Typically used for IDS, IPS. Uh, one drawback is bandwidth overload. So if we tried to mirror traffic from too many switch ports to one switch port. Let's say just on a simple, you know, 
I'm going to use it, go back old school. I got 29, 24, uh, 100 megabit per second. You know, what's the speed capacity of the switch ports? So if I wanted to take three ports and they're running at kind of full capacity, it's 300 megabits per second. And I'm mirroring it to one other port, then uh, that would be bandwidth overload. And, I can, and it's going to drop. It's not, it's not going to forward all that traffic. And the reason why that's important is because if I'm using a span port for my IDS IPS and I am having bandwidth overload, I'm not going to see all the traffic. And so I might have this false sense of security. Uh, you know, I got an IDS there, but your IDS is only seeing a third of the traffic. That's a problem. Uh, yeah, definitely. IDS IPS and will be in monitor mode and we'll get to IDS IPS here in a little bit too. Yeah, typically um, multiple modes for IPS and IDS. So we have span ports, then we also have TAPS. TAPS stand for test access port. Um, basically it allows you to see all the unicast streams on the network. So unicast is, did we talk about broadcast, multicast, unicast? Did we talk about any of that stuff? Unicast is one-to-one -one communication. Multicast is one-to-many. Uh, broadcast is one-to-all, basically. And so unicast streams, if computer A is communicating with computer B, usually computer C, you know, kind of in the middle, uh, if it's not addressed to computer C, it won't, um, it won't process it. Unless I put it in promiscuous mode, then it would process it if it saw it. Uh, but I might have to put a test in a, in a switch, being that switches break up those broadcast domains or those collision domains on layer two. Uh, if I'm connected to a switch port, I won't I won't see that traffic. So, um, yeah, does that make sense? Sort of. Okay. Layer three devices, routers. So this is logical addressing. This is, so layer two is collision domains. Layer three is what's called broadcast domains. Uh, so layer threes route traffic from one LAN to another. They also route traffic from one VLAN to another. Uh, they make routing decisions based on source and destination IP addresses, which are in the IP header. Uh, in the real, real world one uh, chassis, this is a little bit old, but you still do C6500s. It's my favorite. So my favorite router or multi-layer switch router, whatever the hell you want to call it now. Uh, but in 6500, you could put different blades in it. You could, so in one chassis, you could have a router switch, firewall. You could have it all built into one nice chassis, even though that's what it's like in the real world. And, and I'm, even in the Nexus, you know, systems, you can do kind of the same thing. Um, for the exam, it's going to be, device by device. So a router routes, so a switch switches, a hub hubs. All right, so routers, static and default routes. So that's two ways. So in order for my router, so I may have four or five hops to get to the next, uh, to, to the destination network. In order for my router to know how to get there, I'd have to, it either have to have a static route in its routing table or a, well, this, this is default, but we're going to talk about routing protocols to it or a dynamic route. Uh, or a default route. So a default route for a router is essentially if I don't know where this traffic goes, I'm just going to send it to the default route. Hopefully that router knows where it goes. Uh, static routes are just routes that you enter in manually, which are fine for, I think, smaller networks and networks that don't change much. Um, uh, and it's every router has a different syntax for how you would enter that. But essentially, routers maintain a routing table, which is uh, all the places all the ways that I can get to other networks that I know about. Simple routing needs, fixed networks, little or no redundancy. Default routes is if I don't know how to get there, just send it here. And like I said, hopefully you know. This is the same, uh, you know, I've seen this diagram, this network diagram so many times. Uh, so we've got office, so office A to get to office B, going through the data center might be the fastest route with two T3s at 45 megabits per second versus the one T1 at 1.544 megabits per second. So, uh, yeah, we're going to talk about why that's important because if, um, here, here's some definitions. So, in a static route, routing, why, why was I going to talk about this? 
well, there's two different types of routing protocols, distance vector and, and uh, link state. I don't think I was going to use it for distance vector or, or link state because in the distance vector routing protocol, all the traffic from Office A would go to, go to Office B through T1 because hop count is the primary routing metric. Uh, whereas in a link state routing protocol like OSPF or EIGRP, which won't be on the exam, I would use uh, the T3s because I'd also take into account bandwidth and speed. But let's see what I wrote. What I, the network depicted previously is redundant paths all four sites. Should any single circuit or site go down, at least one alternative path is available. The fastest circuits are 45 t megabit per second T3s. Should the leftmost T3 go down the data center in Office A, there are multiple paths between the data center and Office A. The fastest is the T3 to Office B and then the T1 to Office A. You could use static routes for this network, preferring the faster T3s over the slower T1s. The problem is if T3 goes down, okay, so that's why. You could do, this is a simple network where I could certainly use static routes, you know, here. Routing tables would be fairly small, uh, but if a link goes down, I'd have to manually reconfigure my, my routing uh, table. So to get over manual routing table entries, uh, you can use what are called routing protocols. Uh, and routing protocols, there's two major types. There are hybrids and others too, but the two, di the two major types are distance vector routing protocols and um, uh, link state routing protocols. There's also different types of routing protocols. There's interior gateway routing protocols, uh, which are used for interior routing typically. And then there's exterior gateway protocols, which are usually used for routing between domains or autonomous systems. Um, yeah, I'm just mentioning that. So uh, metrics are used to determine the best route across the network. Simplest metric is hop count. Most of the distance vector routing protocols use hop count. That means how many hops or systems do I need to transverse to get to my destination network. Does not account for link speed between networks and prone to uh, routing loops. Routing loops typically happen because of convergence time. Convergence time is how long it takes to uh, basically recompute, recalculate my routing table. Um, so here's the most popular uh, distance vector routing protocol is uh, routing information protocol or RIP. Uh, uses hop count as a metric, no, does not have a full view of the network, so it doesn't try to build the entire network topology. It only sees its directly connected routers. So, uh, you know, to get to all these networks, I would go through this hop. In order to get to all these networks, I'd go through this hop. But that, so it doesn't build a full network topology like OSPF would. Uh, convergence is slow. Convergence is how long it takes for the network to basically agree with itself. The routing tables have been all updated. Uh, once all the routing tables in the network have updated, that would say, you'd say it's converged. You know, convergence is completed. Sends routing updates every 30 seconds. So this is chatty, regardless if there are any routing changes. Maximum hop count is 15. 16 is considered infinite. So I can't use this in a really complicated uh, enterprise type network, RIP would not be used. RIP version one was only used for classful. So if you remember, we had classful and classless interdomain routing. Classful is the A, B, and C, and we're stuck to the slash 8, 16, and 24. Uh, actually, that's, I just decided to take uh, the 10, the 17216, the 19216, yeah. Uh, so classful. Uh, networks. Route, route, uh, RIP version 2 allowed, allowed now for classless interdomain routing. So um, I could do subnetting here. I could be a little more uh, granular with how I give out IP addresses. Split horizon uh, means that I won't argue back. So if the router here, so I may think, so what, what can happen uh, without split horizon in the routing loop is we never end up converging because we keep arguing. I know that to get to this route, it's over here. I know to get to this route, it's over here. Well, but I know it's, a, you know, so you keep getting these routing updates and that becomes a routing loop. Split horizon was, was, is implemented to try to prevent that. Uh, and then hold down timers are to avoid flapping. So if the network 
route status keeps going up and down, it's not going to keep sending routing updates and flapping. So that's about all you need to know for RIP. Uh, OSPF is a link state routing protocol. Uh, a bunch of different metrics that you can use to determine the best route to a network like bandwidth, uh, latency, um, hop count. You know, those are all part of, you know, there's a number of different metrics that you can use um, to determine the best route. So going back to that example, those DS3s and the T1s or the T3s and the T1s would be accounted for in determining the best path through the network. So it's much better performance. Um, they learn the entire network topology rather than just the neighbors. So it's not a network by rumor. It's it's the full network topology within their area. So an area you can think of as of an area as kind of being a an OSPF domain almost, if you will. Uh, router send event driven updates. So it's not the chatty every thirty seconds type updates and a lot faster convergence. So the routing routers in an OSPF network will all agree uh, on the routes to, to get to different places fairly quickly. BGP, this is an exterior routing protocol. So an exterior gateway routing protocol, so or an exterior routing protocol. The um, meaning it's not used in LANs like OSPF. OSPF can be used both ways. RIP traditionally is just used in small networks. BGP is really used for kind of routing between autonomous systems on the internet. Uh, so it's the routing protocol used on the internet routes between autonomous systems. Autonomous systems are assigned, if I recall from the IANA, that Internet Assigned Numbering Authority, hands out autonomous systems, has some distance vector properties, but you know, formally it's considered a path vector routing protocol. So it's not distance vector and it's not, um, uh, not, link, not link state, but kind of a hybrid. So EIGRP not covered. So Cisco, <coughs> excuse me, that's Cisco enhanced interior gateway routing protocol. That's not going to be on the test. So you don't have to worry about those proprietary ones. That's those are basically the firewalls, or the firewalls, the routing protocols that you need to know for the exam. Uh, RIP, OSPF, BGP. There are a ton of different ones. Uh, other ones. There's IGRP. There's uh, EIGRP, IS. There's a bunch of them. Uh, all right. So the next network device. So we talked about routers. We talked about switches. We talked about hubs. Hubs, repeaters, switches, bridges, routers. Now, kind of going up from there. Firewalls. Firewalls can also do it. We can also do that at layer three, though. Um, but filter traffic between networks. Um, two basic types of firewalls are packet filtering and stateful firewalls. Uh, make decisions based on layer three and four. So IP addresses and ports. What's an IP address and a port? Socket. Bam. Uh, yeah. So it's going to make decisions based on on that. Uh, Typically, proxy firewalls can make uh, decisions all the way up through layer seven. So that includes even the context of even what I typed into the computer uh, can be restricted, or, you know, permitted or denied, you know, through a proxy firewall. Firewalls are multi-home; they have multiple NICs, network interface cards, connected to multiple different networks. The purpose of a firewall really is to act as a gatekeeper between two networks of different. Uh, security levels or security sensitivities, basically. So different types of firewalls, uh, a packet filter firewall. This would be an example. This would be um, like an, an old Cisco router without the, the firewall feature set installed would be a packet filtering firewall, um, which means it would have no context of where of how the network traffic was operating. It simply made its routing or it's forwarding decision based on uh, source source IP address um, port destination IP address port. It only had those four kind of variables, but it maintained it didn't maintain a state, so it wouldn't. So in this example here, uh, you know, ICMP echo request and echo reply. The attacker is sending an echo reply. Um, 
through the firewall and there's no context of whether the computer had actually, if this was a response to Necro request or not. You know what I'm saying? So if the, if the, if the firewall had maintained state, it would know that computer one had never sent an echo request to evil.example.com, so it would never permit an echo reply back in because it wasn't actually a reply to something. Whereas a state or a packet filter firewall, you know, could potentially, it's very easy to spoof traffic and bypass these firewalls. So no concept of state, um, no way to refer past packets to current packets, um, less secure. Um, yeah, pretty easy to evade these firewalls. Uh, stateful packet, so this would, sometimes it's called stateful packet inspection firewall or stateful firewalls. Uh, they would maintain a state, so they maintain a table of all the connections. This one went here, you know, and this is a response back, you know, so on and so forth. It would maintain that entire state. Um, the bad thing about stateful firewalls is sometimes you can crash them because you can send so much traffic through them that you fill that buffer. You end up filling the uh, state table. I've done that before. I've done that on Palo Alto's. I was doing a. Uh, I don't think I don't think anybody online is from that customer, but I was given a Class B network to do vulnerability scanning on external. It's an external class B network space. That's like unheard of. So it's 16,630, whatever number, um, IPs. And so, like, well, you know, let's, let's kick it off and see what happens. Well, within like two hours, we had filled the state tables of these Palo Alto firewalls and brought down their whole internet connection. Yeah. That was only like, that was only like a year or two ago. Crazy. Uh, but anyway, stateful firewalls maintain that state table. So it is a little bit faster, but definitely far far more secure because the firewall can make uh, decisions uh, in context, whereas the, you know, the packet filtering one can't happen. Uh, so proxy firewalls. Proxy, you know, just like the name means, it's act on behalf of. So... In a proxy firewall, the proxy actually acts on behalf of the client. Um, so the client kind of communicates with the proxy and the proxy communicates with uh, uh, the server. Terminates the connections. Uh, very secure because now the server can also make uh, decisions all the way through the protocol stack, including the application layer. Intermediaries, intermediary servers, proxies, terminate connections. Application layer proxies operate all the way up to layer seven. They can make filtering decisions based on basically anything in the packet uh, in the data. You have to understand what proxy or the protocol that's being proxied. So um, in older implementations, you'd, you might have to have a proxy running for each type of data. So you have an FTP proxy, you'd have an HTTP proxy, you'd have a SMTP proxy, you'd have all these different proxies. Um, in newer implementations of proxy firewalls, um, you don't need that or it's built into the software, so you don't even know you have that. Uh, allows for tighter control of filtering decisions. So two basic types of proxies, an application layer proxy and then circuit level proxies. Circuit level proxies, SOX is a type of circuit level proxy, but it's not, they're not synonymous. Uh, circuit level layer five. Um, they work a lot like uh, the stateful firewalls, other than the fact that they're actually proxying, meaning that's about how far up they go in the protocol stack. Um, so they filter more protocols, understand each protocol. Um, it doesn't look into typically the application layer data. Uh, SOX, the latest version is version five. SOX is a, uh, you need to have a SOX client. Um, or the apps, the application has to be, they call it Soxified. It has to be configured to use uh, Sox and pass the right data. Uh, so that's all you need to know for Sox. Uh, fundamental firewall designs, the first, the easiest, uh, and actually 
becoming much more popular are bastion hosts. So bastion hosts basically, um, it's like a hop between, really. A host placed on the internet, uh, which is not protected by another device, such as a firewall. They have to be hardened. Um, but So for instance, you, it's not uncommon now to use a bastion host to get into a PCI cardholder data environment. So you would connect to the Bastion host and then from the Bastion host, connect to something else. And the Bastion host is meant to um, kind of provide that firewalling between the two or an intermedi intermediary. And the purpose is um, if my computer gets completely compromised, the Bastion host should stop my communication with what I'm eventually communicating with from also getting compromised. It kind of sits in the way. Dual homed host, two network interfaces, one connected to a trusted network, the other connected to an untrusted network, such as the internet. Host does not route. Uh, user wishing to access a trusted network from the internet will log in to a dual homed host first. So this would be like a, uh, almost like a, uh, you know, at least logically, um, like using the, gosh, my brain is, like VMware? Uh, no. Citrix. Kind of the same thought process. Common design before firewall. So you would connect to the, you would log in to the dual home host and then from the dual home host, log in really similar to Bastion host. Screen host architecture. So older, flat. These are not popular anymore. Uh, but one router to filter external traffic to and from the Bastion host. The Bastion host actually sits behind the screening router, which was typically just a packet filtering router. It was not a stateful router. Uh, Bastion host can reach other internal resources, but the router ACL forbids direct internal external connectivity. So we would only have connectivity from the internet to the Bastion host and then from the Bastion host to other internal systems. That's the screened host arc VDI. Thank you, Phil. I love Phil. Uh, screened uh, host, did I just say that twice? Did I forget to change the top? Mm. So basically, oh, I had forgotten a couple of, I just forgot a couple of bullet points. Yeah, anyway. DMZ network screened host. So DMZ, if most, of, most of us probably know what a DMZ is, demilitarized zone. Uh, typically, anything that's going to be externally accessible or accessible from an untrusted network you put into the DMZ uh, network. The purpose being that if that host gets completely compromised, the damage is kind of contained to the demilitarized zone versus my own internal network or, or something more sensitive. So hosts that receive traffic from untrusted networks such as the internet should be placed in DMZ networks. It's a good best practice. Uh, yeah, hosts in the DMZ should be hardened. So your web servers, mail servers, FTP servers, FTP, SFTP servers, whatever you've got that requires kind of that external or the untrusted network connectivity, those would be the things to put in the, the DMZ. Uh, DMZ networks and screened uh, subnet architecture. This is actually two different physical firewalls uh, called a screened subnet. Uh, so you can see the DMZ is between the two firewalls. Pretty secure, but um, it's hard to get budget for two firewalls like that. Instead of what you usually have, is you might be able to get budget for two firewalls, but you use the redundancy piece. Right? So it's going to be an active passive configuration. So if one fails, it'll roll over to the other. Not like this. Uh, screamed subnet architecture. So the firewall, this is pretty similar. Three-legged DMZ. So the firewall uh, might have three ports, physical or logical. Doesn't really matter. Uh, where the internet's on one port, a trusted or an untrusted network, the DMZ, and then the trusted network on the inside. Uh, yeah, that's another architecture design. Uh, screen subnet, single firewall. 
yeah, untrusted, trusted, DMC, dual network, dual firewall designs are more complex, but considered more secure, I suppose. I said we had to set up a network once for the Department of Defense. Um, what they required was four layers of security. So typically in a web architecture, you might have three layers. You might have uh, an interface layer or web layer. You have an application layer and then maybe a data layer, you know, just in the, in the architecture of the service design. Uh, this one had four layers. I can't remember now. It was like a data transfer layer. It was a weird layer. But they required redundancy, so you had to have two of these stacks. And between each layer, they required a separate firewall. And the separate firewall had to come from a separate manufacturer in case there was a bug or something was compromised in one. And the same thing on each one of these DMZs was uh, a separate manufacturer uh, IPS. So we had... Uh, IBM Preventia, which back then was ISS, um, Dragon IDS, I don't know, but we had like all these technologies. So if you wanted to manage this, you had to be an expert in Cisco, uh, Checkpoint, I mean, it was such a crazy freaking architecture. And so what they, what they ended up doing, so I've said before that complexity is the enemy of security. This network was so complex and required so much you couldn't be an expert in any one part of the architecture because if you were responsible for all of it, you couldn't be an expert in all of it. So it ended up making it um, much less secure, you know, at the end of the day. Not, you know, it was just crappy. All right, modem, uh, modulator, demodulator. I don't know how many uh, slides I have left, but hopefully not too many because I'm going to try to speed up. we got 10 minutes. Uh, so modem, modulator, demodulator, basically taking analog, uh, transferring and modulating it back to or binary data. So binary data is digital. It's ones and zeros. Uh, so binary data is modulated into an analog and, and vice versa. Uh, we don't see modems very much anymore. Uh, asynchronous devices. Actually, modems are probably really secure nowadays because they just don't use them anymore. They're not targeted like they used to be. We used to do war dialing. Uh, to attack modems, so you just basically take an entire block of phone numbers and just, yep, set it and forget it and see what answered, and then you'd come back and, so you'd see what answered in the first pass, and then the things that answered would be your targets for the next pass, and then you'd actually connect to them and see if, uh, see if there are default logins or no login at all. Uh, what was that, War Games? No, no. What was that movie? The kid who almost started World War Three. Is that War Games? Yeah. Do you want to play a game? Yeah. I got. I should watch that again. That was so awesome. Classic. Uh, all right. Asynchronous devices meaning there's no clocking. Because uh, asynchronous means that there's no. Like typically in a synchronous, you have a clock rate or something that synchronizes the two systems. Asynchronous devices means there's no. There's none of that. Boom. Old school, yeah, big coupler with the, the phone rotary dial, the uh, or like Oregon Trail or something on that thing. All right, DTE, DCE, uh, data terminate, data, data terminal equipment, and data circuit terminating equipment. Um, you'll have to memorize this as well. So, data terminal equipment, the key word there is terminal. So a terminal is uh, a client side thing. It's an endpoint typically. Uh, so server, desktop, it's client side. Data circuit terminating equipment uh, is typically, um, uh, it's typically, well, I guess I was gonna say it was typically carrier side, but that's not necessarily, mostly. it would be something like a distribution system, uh, like a router. Um, Something like that. DTE, DTC, DCE uh, means that uh, it, it kind of spans both of those. So the DTE's responsibility of the customer, the DCE, would be on the ISP's network, and they would be responsible for that. Uh, where the DCE and the DTE meet, that's called the DMARC or the demarcation point. Uh, the biggest risk, I think, in demarcation points is shared demarcation points, like we talked about in the, the physical. 
uh, thing. DCEDT asynchronous, so it uses a clock signal to communicate uh, or synchronize the uh, systems communicating on CSU DSUs, channel service unit, data service unit. The newer ones were called terminal service units or TSUs. Um, but a DCE device is like a like a modem, something like that. And its whole purpose really was, or its major purpose was to maintain the synchronicity of you know on the network. And these are older networks. 300 baud. That's right. Uh, IDS IPS. So I got I to. I do have a little bit more to go, so I got to go. Hurry up. Uh, IDS. And the keyword there, D, d is detection. So it's not an active device. It's a passive device. It doesn't take action on the data that it sees. And then IPS is a preventative device. So there is an action, something that happens. Uh, there's different ways that you can put IDS and IPS systems in a network. You can either put them uh, in line or you know, uh, in line or uh, not offline, but uh, kind of connected to it, not going through it, but connected to it kind of thing. Uh, so IDS, IPS, uh, network-based and host-based. So we're going to have NIDs, NIPs, HIPs, HIDs, and HIPs. And so knowing what those things are. So NIDs and NIPs, these are network-based intrusion detection and intrusion prevention systems. TAP, thank you, Neil. Uh, detect malicious traffic on a network. They're, uh, yeah, they just essentially sit there and look for traffic. It can, it can either be anomaly-based or behavioral, uh, in, in which case it's looking for, for something that's outside of the norm, outside of the pattern. So your, your NID or your NIP would have to learn the traffic patterns typically and, and then detect those anomalies. The other one or the other method of, you know, finding uh, potential attack traffic would be signature-based. Uh, NIDs and NIPs usually require promiscuous mode. So again, that's a network interface card that's been configured to basically process every single packet it sees, not just the ones that are addressed to it. Uh, passive devices on NIPs, sorry, NIDs. Uh, NIDs are passive because it's the detection piece and NIPs are active. And you can see the two different kind of designs there. The NIPs on the bottom, that's inline. And then the, uh, yeah, the other one. So two types of NIPs, active response and inline. So active response would be the one that's hanging off of it, uh, nece not necessarily uh, inline. Inline means it's going directly through it. SNORT, if you've never played with network intrusion detection systems before, SNORT is free and it's easy to use and it's actually pretty good quality. It's very well supported. Uh, false positive uh, by NIPS is more damaging, uh, obviously, because we'll be denying. So one of the things that that, are, that that happens is we have customers who have their NIPS running in learning mode kind of forever. They never actually turn on the active deny traffic piece uh, because they're afraid that once they turn that on, the false positives are going to stop like the CEO's mail. Uh, so HIDs and HIPs, so N in the NIDs and NIPs was network. These are host-based intrusion detection and intrusion prevention systems, uh, processes within the host. Uh, Tripwire, sort of well-known. Oh, I mean, it's well-known, but I don't know about the quality. That's a pretty good diagram there. Usually you have sensors and, uh, you know, back to here. Usually you have a, a management system and you have sensors. So that NIPS that's in the bottom would be a sensor uh, in that architecture. And then the management system is manages a bunch of sensors. Uh, pattern matching, proto, uh, so pattern matching would be using those signatures that I mentioned before. Uh, very few false positives, but doesn't identify a lot of the new attacks. Easier to evade uh, a pattern matching intrusion detection and prevention system. Protocol behavior, so um, if, for instance, I would mentioned before, you know, how you can monkey with flags and headers to make things do something different. Uh, protocol behavior, uh, IDS, IPS would notice that this is not a normal packet. I'm going to deny it uh, or an alert on it. Anomaly detection is just anything that deviates from the baseline indicates that there's a potential for an attack. Usually a lot more false positives in anomaly detection. Um, 
but it identifies a lot of the newer attacks. Honeypots, somebody had mentioned honeypots before. Um, honeypots are used to attract, attacker, attract attackers. In most cases, it's used for research, so we want to see what the, the latest attackers are doing, uh, maybe. Uh, other times, we might use a honeypot to distract an attacker or give them a more attractive target on my network than the stuff I'm really trying to protect. And then I'm watching the things that are happening on the honeypot, uh, and then that is an early warning that something's happening on my network. So kind of different reasons to use honeypots. Uh, HoneyNets is a network of honeypots. Uh, maybe it's just a Windows XP system you just throw out there on the network and put some monitoring on it and see what happens. Uh, no production value beyond research. Consult with legal. I remember when we talked about um, entrapment and enticement. We want to entice attackers. We don't want to get caught entrapping attackers. We also don't want our honey pot to be used to attack other. So a typical attack sequence is you, you, once you compromise a system, you kind of just determine what can I do with this system. Uh, maybe I can use it as a pivot into other systems. We don't want that in our honey pot. If you want to know more about honey pots, you can go to honeynet.org. Good place to learn up. Network attacks. I just have some really basic ones. I'm just going to go through really quick. These are all old attacks. They don't work anymore unless you got somebody running Windows NT on your network. Uh, you shouldn't see any of these. There really are countless base, countless network attacks. You don't need to be uh, a penetration tester or a, an elite hacker in order to pass the CISSP. You just need to know the basics. Um, I've said it before. It's like a mile wide, two inches deep. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about. Um, many of these have been mitigated already. So a TCP SYN flood. You remember there's a three-way handshake. There's a SYN, SYNAC, and an ACK back. Um, you send a SYN packet, it's going to hold that socket or that connection open, waiting for the ACK back. So you send a SYN packet, it sends a SYN ACK back. It's going to wait a certain amount of time for that ACK to come back to, to formally establish the three-way handshake. Uh, well, if I send enough SYN packets from enough different spoofed uh, source IP addresses, um, I could fill the buffer and crash the system, and that's what a, a SYN flood is used. It's called half-open connections. It doesn't work really anymore. A land attack is using the so basically using the same source and end destination IP address. So who you're attacking? So in this case, we got the one nine two zero two two twenty one. We're attacking that one, and so we've spoofed the source IP address to be one nine two zero two two twenty one same port as what we're directing the traffic to. And the purpose is, is to start to exhaust resources uh, on the system. So you would uh, try to crash the system. This doesn't work anymore either. But a land attack. These were back in the glory days when you could just, you just tried all kinds of things and they, some of them worked, some of them didn't. Uh, Smurf attack and fraggle attack. So they're here together because they're both used kind of the same mechanism. It's called an amplification attack. So um, what I would do is I would ping, I would spoof the IP address of the system that I'm actually attacking. So let's say I want to attack 192.168.100.1. I would send a packet from myself to a broadcast network address with a, with a source address spoofed as the 192.168.100.1. So the purpose that the broadcast responses would all flood my target. So I would ping, you know, maybe a, maybe somebody's got a class B out there, and I, you know, I, I know of a thousand different hosts. I would ping all those hosts, source address of my of the one I'm attacking, and then they would all respond back, and then hopefully crash that system or exhaust its resources. That's what a Smurf attack is. Fraggle is the same thing, but using UDP packets instead of ICMP packets. And these also don't work anymore. A teardrop attack, we would use big packets and we would use overlapping. So they, the, the system receiving these packets would have no idea how to put these things back together again. 
it would quickly fill the buffer and then it would crash the system. And so it was just about trying to get these packets to get reassembled. They had no idea how to do it and it would crash. This doesn't work anymore either. Again, unless you have an NT system, those will definitely work on those. So we're at nine o'clock. We still have a little bit to get through for this domain, but we certainly took what, what I was expecting to be three full classes to get through this domain, and we're going to do it in about two and a little bit. So we've kind of made up some time uh, when we where we lost it between the encryption and the physical security. Originally, I was going to try to crunch that into one. We took that into two. Uh, so we're getting you know certainly back up back on track again, which is good because I wanted to use that last class, class thirteen to uh, to kind of go through some test questions together and really open up you know the lines for people to ask questions and what have you. So finish reading uh, this domain if you can then start reading domain five where we'll talk about IAM or identity and access management. Uh, we have a full weekend. I think if you're here in Minnesota it's gonna be a great weekend. I'm gonna I got my see my bike out there. I'm gonna ride that forever this weekend. Does the CISSP test contain crypto problems like you showed us? No. Now I just found that the problems help to kind of get it in my head better, but I don't think there'll be crypto problems like that that you have to solve. Be kind of cool. So, all right, have a great weekend. Subnetting questions? No, I doubt subnetting questions, but I would love to teach you subnetting if you anybody wants to know or supernetting. I like doing that stuff. All right, guys, have a great weekend. We'll uh, we'll see you later. Enjoy the weather. Did you like it better?